Today, we talk data science platforms, we talk machine learning tooling, we talk Databricks, Kubeflow, Snowflake, but that's not all we talk about. We also go into how to make the right trade-offs for the goals that you are trying to reach. This is The Conversation with Skylar Payne, and you're listening to the MLOps Community Coffee Session Podcast. We're talking with Skylar today, and we've got all kinds of takeaways that we want to get to. There was a ton of stuff that we wrote that we were going to talk about, but then he just goes and he drops a blog post, what, two days ago or three days ago? And it created a lot of chatter. So I think we should start there. This blog post, Skylar, maybe you can give us the overview real fast, and then we'll dive into the particulars and then some things that people were saying in Slack about it. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, the, the title of the blog post is Data is Wicked. And sort of the, you know, I think like if people have been reading some of the LinkedIn posts I've been making uh, over the last couple of months, I've had like a lot of posts that uh, kind of dig at Kubeflow and dig at a lot of things in the MLOps space. And I've, over my time of like using various MLOps tools, both from the perspective of building them myself in large tech companies like LinkedIn, and also from the perspective of like working with vendors to evaluate options, I kind of just saw that we're, we're building up all this stuff and everyone's focusing on a lot of things like how scalable this solution is, et cetera. And I'm just watching data scientists try to work with these tools and they're struggling and they're stressed. And really like there's just so many pieces and we've kind of like built up this thing that's super complex. You know, I think uh, Eric uh, Bernhardt's and uh, wrote a little bit about how, you know, industries naturally go through like bundling and unbundling. And it seems like we, we kind of have unbundled too much and there's just like too many pieces. And when I look at like a data scientist workflow, it's like they're not able to like iterate effectively with many of the tools that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really just trying to dig at that and saying like, hey, we need to focus on that sort of iteration um, and also accessibility as sort of like first class concerns. There's a few things that I want to mention about this. And mm -hmm. one is the way that you talk and the things that I see you post on LinkedIn, I feel like you are secretly building something on your own that's going to address all of these problems that you bring up. However, then you come to find out that you aren't doing anything in the MLOps space or building an MLOps tool, at least that I know of. If you are, mm -hmm. please let us know. And I love that because you are bringing out these issues, but you're not like a vendor that's saying, look, here's my solution that will solve these issues. And the other thing that I wanted to mention when you're talking about the bundling and unbundling is one argument I've heard is machine learning and basically the data space is so complicated that you need all of these different pieces. And so when you have something that will bundle up all of these pieces, it effectively gives you a very opinionated way of doing things. And then if you want to get out of that way of doing things, you spend the majority of your time doing that, trying to break out of the mold. And so how do you let those two ideas coexist? Like, yes, I understand People are suffering, especially the data scientists, the poor data scientists who are trying to figure out if they need to learn Kubernetes in order to be able to use Kubeflow, right? And then there's the other side where it's like, okay, well, just give me everything in the SageMaker suite and we're going to do it the SageMaker way and we're going to pay the extra costs and that doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, I, I generally find... Uh, when I, you know, I sort of joined the company I'm at uh, probably like seven or eight months ago. And uh, while I was kind of like interviewing around, uh, I was very surprised at a lot of the companies I talked to would talk about adopting Kubeflow. And I really dug into sort of like their challenges and why they're adopting Kubeflow. And honestly, the conclusion I came to is most of them were adopting Kubeflow just because they thought that that's kind of like the best practice and the right thing to do. So I think there, there is an element where, yes, there is a lot of complexity in the data space. Absolutely. But I also think that right now we're in a phase where there's so much noise that people are taking on more complexity than they really need just because they think that's what you're supposed to do. Um, like when I hear people talk about like the modern data stack, people keep putting out these articles like this is the stack that you need to have and whatnot. And I just look at it and I'm like, 
this is like 10 tools. I like doubt that 80% of people actually need that level of complexity, you know? And, you know, I think like there's a, there's a flavor here of, you know, uh, my experience is not your experience or mileage may vary, you know, but I, just when I look at like a lot of people adopting all these tools, I just think you are spending so much time iterating on this infrastructure and ML ops. And that stuff is supposed to enable you to deliver business value. But all the time you spend there, you're not delivering business value. And so you have to like figure out like what is like the the Pareto optimization of like things that I need that are really going to help support me deliver business value. And I think that that uh, is often uh, a miss from like a lot of like data plays. That is a really good segue into the main thing I wanted to ask you about, which is in your article, I think I think it's a very interesting point um, around the comparison between the machine learning world and the analytics world. And mm -hmm. this is, it's something we've kind of touched on, you know, uh, we had a previous coffee session where, you know, Eric, who you mentioned, Eric Bernhardson, yeah. uh, formerly of Spotify, joined us, and, and Mike Dove also of Tecton joined us, and, and they kind of had a meeting of the minds, right, where they talked about this machine learning versus analytics world. But I don't think, actually, that here's my, uh, my hot mm -hmm. take to kind of pair with your uh, article, which is, I don't think that many machine learning professionals actually know what goes on in the analytics world, because a lot of them start off with a lot of model.fits and CSVs as their first mm -hmm. experience into this entire, you know, world wicked world of wicked data, as you describe it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true in your experience as well? And if so, how should machine learning professionals correct that viewpoint that they may have or isolated viewpoint they have? Yeah, I, I think it's totally true. I totally agree with that. Um, and I think this is just, uh, we have like a further and further specialization of roles and people generally aren't sort of like looking at what's happening in the uh, uh, role beside you. Um, I, there's this book I've been reading, uh, Range, uh, and one of the quotes that I love from it, uh, he says something, you know, like this specialization has created all of these isolated trenches and nobody's like looking in the trench next to you, even though that contains the solution you want. Um, and I think a lot of that uh, tends to happen when we have sort of this like uh, functional division essentially in companies. And so absolutely, I think machine learning engineers often don't like have a view into the analytics world. Um, as far as like how to correct for that, you know, I think like the, the sort of like the insight I got looking at this was mostly just from talking to a lot of analytics people. Uh, when I was at LinkedIn, I was sort of in a role that uh, was like, uh, Essentially, I acted as a liaison between a lot of different groups uh, at LinkedIn, uh, between like AI, AI infrastructure, um, et cetera. And so I, I got to see a lot of diverse perspectives. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's something that needs to be corrected with machine learning engineers needing to like understand analytics. Um, but I do think everybody, no matter what role you're in, you need to find a way to bring in more diverse perspectives from other roles because analogies you can make, you can see, hey, they're doing this thing like this. What can I learn from that? What is that telling me about what I'm doing that I could improve? Um, and you know, this comparison I make in that article, I think is like one thing that I took away from seeing how analysts uh, tend to work and something that works well for them. You know, It's interesting you say that because obviously at LinkedIn, you can do that. You have resources and it's a very large company. And if you're working at a large company, that's probably easier to do. What about those startups that are trying to get the machine learning off the ground? And a lot of people tell me in the community, I'm an MLOps team of one. How do they bring in the uh, various perspectives that can help them? Is it just by like joining other communities? Should they go into mm -hmm. locally optimistic and should they go into these other obscure data engineering communities or listen to data engineering podcasts? How do you feel uh, they can bring different perspectives? Yeah, I think all those are great uh, ideas. I mean, I think in general, joining communities is the best way. Like I think like, having one-on-one -on -one chats is great. Uh, so, you know, like in the MLOps community, there's like those coffee chats that get set up. Um, and I think those are great and those are awesome. And, you know, every once in a while, someone will reach out to me and say like, hey, you know, I saw you write something about this. I was interested in it and I want to chat about it. And that's super cool. Um, I think like one of the challenges often is uh, I think like often when you want to like reach out to somebody because you 
might want to chat with them about something. I think like a lot of people feel nervous that they're going to get rejected or that the other person's not going to have time. And like, in my experience, most people, like if you just like reach out and like say like, Hey, I'd love to like have a 30 minute chat. Like almost everybody mm -hmm. seems like fairly open with that. Like rarely have I ever seen uh, that be rejected. And so, uh, you know, I think it's hard as a community to kind of like build a culture like that. Um, but like the more that you can do that, the more I think you start getting a sort of like cross pollination of ideas and experiences. So, yeah, it's really interesting that you point that out because that is one of the one of my favorite things about the MLOps community is we have so many people that talk about how they've been able to meet incredible people like yourself through the community. And it's oftentimes just by reaching out to someone like you, because they saw something you posted to an answer or uh, the MLOps questions answer. And there's some thread that you had some insight on. Uh, mm -hmm. I also wanted to say, if you are nervous, then just spend some time in sales and that will get all of your nerves out of the way. You'll take learn how to take rejection like a champ. Or there are some people I've heard that uh, there's like drills to make you do something that's outside of your comfort zone once mm -hmm. a day, like asking someone if you can use their phone or asking uh, the coffee shop you go to for a discount. Those kind of things will make you really feel outside of outside of your comfort zone and hopefully it will help you in that but that was a very very uh, big tangent that we went on there vishnu i see you foaming at the mouth to ask another question what do you got for us well i think i want to go back to that comment about teams of one right i think if i had to guess a lot of companies start their machine learning journey by kind of someone saying someone with a little bit of, you know, someone with the management authority or some kind of executive saying, you know, it'd be cool if we did some machine learning on this. And then you go out and it just so happens, you know, at some meetup or conference, they hear somebody, you know, or they meet somebody that has a machine learning background. They say, you know what? We have a ton of data. You should really join us and do, you know, machine learning. And lo and behold, you know, you have your first, machine learning hire, you start your machine learning team. And, 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 and that's the way I think countless of these stories start. And I think, you know, that is at the root of why we have a lot of complaints about the overall MLOps world. But I guess my question to you, Skylar, when you hear that story, it happens and it happens in that way, rather than just taking their first you know, batch data or CSV file and fitting a model. How do you think that machine learning professional can go about setting the right building blocks for the use of data and machine learning going forward? Yeah, it, that's a great question. And I, you know, and I think like that you, you can see flavors of this if you read like threads that uh, I, I think like both Lazo and I are in. And I, I, I push back often on this idea of production quality. Uh, in that I, I don't I, I don't really think that it's I think people talk about it almost in a black and white sense. And I think it's it's more nuanced than that. Um, I, I get a sense that, you know, in those threads, I could see Lazo and I like roughly agree, I think. But, uh, you know, I think like one of the problems is if you're an MLOps team of one, you you your bar for like production quality should be much lower than a team of 10. You know, and I think that that should be clear and obvious. Um, so I think like oftentimes you, we have to be careful of not biting off more than we can chew. Um, and we have to like scale our efforts down. And there, there are different ways to do that. One might be, you know, you adopt more complete like platform like solutions. Uh, and this is something I know you're interviewing uh, Jacopo uh, next week. And he, this is something that he pushes. And I, I love his ideas in the space. Um, but also it might be that, hey, we're going to not have model monitoring, even though that's something very important. We should obviously like have it. You know, we need to kind of get the first end to end thing first, and maybe it's not going to have monitoring and then we can iterate and add monitoring in, you know. Um, but as far as like, you know, maybe more tangibly what you can do, I wrote another article about this. Uh, so I think like the first MLOps problem you should solve is thinking about how you package models, because uh, effectively that ends up being the sort of handoff between your training and serving systems. Um, and if you put some thought into that upfront, 
you can kind of decouple both of those things. And I think that helps you scale a little bit um, in terms of like, as you bring people on board, you kind of have like a well-defined interface between them. That's, that's a great, that's a great point. I actually think I like that term interfaces. I love it every time I hear it, I get, I get, you know, a little smile, <laughs> but I, I think it's actually a very useful point there because when you're defining your process and your interfaces, you know, you're automatically becoming a lot more scalable than if you were just engaging in these sort of like one-off outputs of, you know, working on models. And, you know, part of the reason I asked that question is because I had this experience, you know, where I joined a company, you know, as like an early machine learning hire. And a lot of my job was just putting out models because that's what I thought I was supposed to do as a machine learning professional. And then realizing, wait, we don't have anywhere for these models to go. And then, you know, incrementally kind of getting into that, into that, into that space. And so I kind of want to unpack this in your journey at your, on your latest, um, you know, role at, at, um, it's, it's called health residence, right? Yeah. Health residence. Yeah. And so, so uh, yeah. Well, tell us about it. Yeah. So uh, right now I uh, am essentially in charge of that broad data team, um, which right now is two data scientists, um, but we're kind of hiring data engineers, machine learning engineers, and data scientists. Um, reach but, out. Uh, basically, reach out to them. Yeah. You want a job. yeah. Definitely reach out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, definitely reach out. Uh, we'd love, love to chat with folks. Um, but uh, what, what we do is called digital phenotyping, uh, which is essentially we're trying to predict uh, mental health symptoms and conditions through phone usage. And it helps us uh, essentially monitor patients. Um, and, you know, when thinking about like our ML ops journey so far, we're, we're a small company. We're like 20 people. Um, we raised like uh, an 11 million seed round. Um and uh, are kind of like moving forward to our Series A in probably a year or so. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're doing pretty well so far, but you know, our ML ops practice hasn't really like gone like very far because we have like two data scientists and we're mostly working on things that are akin to like feature engineering. And so like the, the things that we need are like pretty thin. So we have like some semblance of like model packaging and like how models need to be defined and whatnot. Um, and we have sort of a way to serve our models. And uh, that's it, it, pretty much it. Um, we're working on some other things around model monitoring, but like really we just got that first sort of end-to-end -end thing in place where, hey, we're able to train models. We're able to put them in a production setting. And now we're kind of like adding and uh, some more fancy bits uh, like a feature store and or you know model monitoring and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I think the key thing was starting out like as simple as possible. You know, you start out with like just being able to like put a model in production in a very bespoke way. And then you think, OK, now I need to like iterate on this and uh, figure out how can I make like a more generalizable format so that I don't have to go through that pain again. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, crawl, walk, run. And so it's like I think a lot of people try to like generalize too early. And it's like if you haven't done it manually first, like probably if you try to automate it, you don't have enough information yet uh, and you're probably going to mess it up. Um, maybe somebody's smart enough to not mess it up and you can like understand all of the intricacies of how to do it in your head. I'm not that smart though. So I, you know, I need to prototype and kind of like work through it manually before uh, I can build like a good automated solution. And I'm guessing the current infrastructure stack you have does not contain Kubeflow. Uh, no, I, you know, and I, I'm not totally like anti Kubeflow. I keep checking back in on it because it, it very, very like, honestly, because there's so much noise around it, I feel like I must be missing something. But every time I look at it, it just seems, uh, I, I can't imagine like realistically using this. Um, you know, I, I chatted with some of the folks from Metaflow though, uh, and they, they shared like their experience of like why they think people use, uh, Kubeflow. It seems to be a, most, to make most sense in companies that have already adopted Kubernetes and gone in pretty hard and deep on that. And then if you want an ML platform and you really like are having the constraint of needs to be on Kubernetes, Kubeflow is really like the only option today. Um, and in that setting, I think that makes a lot more sense to me. But, you know, I don't I don't really know Kubernetes um, and I Part of me hopes I'll, I'll never learn it, but you know maybe there's going to be a day where I have to. But 
we'll see what happens. Well, it's one thing that I just wanted to remark, and then I'll let Vishnu go, is that you, I think it was you who brought up this question, like, where are all of the success stories with Kubernetes? Yeah. Because there are so many people and companies that we hear about that are using them, but we don't see the use case blogs with mm -hmm. uh, Kubeflow. Sorry if I said Kubernetes earlier. It, Kubernetes obviously has its, its stuff. I'm talking about Kubeflow. And I don't know if there are any, there's like one Spotify one, right? What you mentioned. But yeah. then other than that, where are all of these Kubeflow success story, use cases, blogs yeah. that we should be seeing if it is as popular and as successful as it is made out to be. And so I yeah. thought that was an interesting one because you can't really point someone to who is going into Kubeflow and looking at Kubeflow and saying, oh, well, I want to get involved. How can I set this up and put it together in my stack? There's no blog post that's like, oh, we'll read these five from these, how these companies have done it, and then you'll get an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was just a, a random thing. I know Vishnu wanted to follow yeah. up on a question that we had before. What did you have for us, yeah. Vishnu? I think the the Kubeflow point is well taken. Um, it's and something we talk a lot about and have talked particularly in the last few episodes about is the difference between sort of the data model and compute parts of the whole machine learning workflow, right? And, and you can kind of say like Kubeflow maybe kind of falls into it. You could loosely say like the compute side because it really has to do with training and productionization and, and whatnot. But um, my question kind of goes back to the data side, right? And what we talked about in terms of, you know, modern data stack and analytics and, and, and how that interacts with machine learning. And my question is, how did you, in the early stages of your, you know, process of building out your stack and your team, take into account the need for machine learning in designing how you thought about your data engineering stack, right? When you think about, you know, doing your ETLs and cleaning up your data and then, you know, kind of putting it into your maybe transaction processing versus your analytical processing, how did you think about merging those two? Because I find, and maybe this is new, I found it seems like a lot of companies start with one and then realize later, ah, shit, we probably, we got, we got to do the second, right? Start off with the very data engineering optimized stack and then it's like, oh man, well, how does that relate to machine learning or vice versa? How did you think about that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think this kind of comes back to the the walk before you run uh, mentality. Um, you know, this is a great book called The Informed Company. Anybody like wanting to like, like understand how like data stacks evolve, highly recommended book. Um, I think that one of the authors is David Fowler and then uh, another person whose name I'm forgetting, but Anyway, uh, this book talks about how like the sort of like phases you move through is you start from source data, then you move to a data lake, then a data warehouse, and then like this data mesh idea um, or, or data marts. Um, I think data mart, data mesh, the, uh, the way they use it is very similar. Uh, but the whole idea is like, you know, I think everybody jumps to, we need to pull all of our data into like one common place. Like we kind of even don't do that at my company today. We're, we're so small that, and the data that we have uh, is not large enough to really justify. We have a unified way to query our data directly from the source. Um, and that kind of works. At some point you hit a level of scale or you hit a level of, uh, you need like a level of production robustness uh, that, you know, like if we have like a bunch of data scientists who are all querying production, like at any given time, you, you might have like a problem there. And, uh, at that point, you maybe need to say like, hey, we need to decouple these, dump all of our stuff into a data lake. Um, and then we might find that we reach challenges with uh, kind of like structuring the data. We need to move to a data warehouse. Um, but I, I think first thinking about like making sure we're moving at the right, we're not getting ahead of ourselves um, and forcing ourselves to make technological decisions before we're kind of like have the right information um, to do so, I think is the, the, the first key point. Um, and the second is I think like, you know, to not make mistakes in choosing that. I, I I have like this fairly strong opinion I've developed. I think a lot of people dig deep onto like what technologies to choose. And then a lot of people feel the pain and think like, oh, I should have chose this other thing. 
And I pretty strongly think you're going to have pain no matter what you pick. And so if you do like a pretty rough analysis and figure out these are like the top three things that exist, you know, probably you're going to feel pain with all of them. And they're probably going to, they're, they're all within like some epsilon going to be roughly equal. You know, like if you, if you go between, you know, two like competitors, you know, that are like both like pretty hot in the space, like it, it's, it's unlikely that like one is like blowing the other out of the water without you realizing it, you know? And so I think like part of the problem here is people just think that the grass is greener on the other side because they, they didn't experience it. Um, and so I don't think that there's actually a huge risk of that happening unless you totally don't even look at the space at all and just pick randomly. Well, especially right now, due to the fact that everything is so new, I completely mm -hmm. agree with you on that. I think I, I talked to, <clears throat> excuse me, I talked to a lot of founders, early stage help tech founders, many of whom aren't necessarily engineering uh, side. And a lot of people talk to me about, should I do GCP, AWS, Azure? What should I do with the cloud stack? You know, how do I make it secure and everything? And I wish I could just send them your clip now. <laughs> I'm like, doesn't matter what you pick. You can pick any one of the big three. I mean, really, honestly, you really can. They're all very good. They all have a lot of features and all of them have some features that the other doesn't. Right. You know, um, and so wherever you go, you're going to be regretting and saying, damn it, I wish this wasn't the case. But, you know, mm -hmm. it, that's always kind of the way that things work out, which I think is a great point. Yeah. So then yeah. what would your advice be? OK, so I am picking I, I accept your advice, scholar. Like I'm not going to spend mm -hmm. as much time reading about tools and I'm not going to spend as much time comparing stuff. I'm going to go with what I'm familiar with. That seems reasonably complete. Where should I allocate the other parts of that time? Where do you think I should be spending more time instead? I, I mean, I think you should be spending that time on like filling the gaps of whichever thing you're picking. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the, the key like insight is that every product is going to have gaps that you're going to mm -hmm. have to fill. Um, and I think like, you know, Laszlo uh, in, in the community has talked about this a lot, that the, the build versus buy is like a false dichotomy. Like you're going to have to like buy some stuff and then you're going to have to build some stuff. Um, and so instead of trying to like spend a bunch of time evaluating all these things to see like, does this perfectly fit my needs, you know, spend that time instead on filling the gaps of something that you think is a reasonable choice. Um, but I, I also want to be careful and like the, the phrasing of this, like, I'm not at all saying like, don't read anything, you know, like, obviously you need to like have some like semblance, but there, there, there's definitely a level where people tend to get like too deep into like analyzing, um, sort of like the options. And I, I think like uh, it's almost like we're we're assuming that we can get a higher level of precision than we actually can, um, because like I think most of the time like we can set company strategies and whatnot, but like the the future of your company is kind of uncertain. And so like if you're trying to like match like the platform your or tools you're adopting today to like the company you're going to have like now and in a year and five years, et cetera, et cetera, there, there's inherent like noise and uncertainty there. And so we have to be careful of like not assuming that there's like more precision than we actually have. And one thing that I wanted to bring up when I was talking to somebody who I can't remember exactly who said this, but a few weeks ago in a meetup, one of the presenters said that the main criteria they use when they're looking at tools is the time that it takes them to learn how to use the tool that is like above anything else. And then there's mm -hmm. all the rest of in their criteria. And so I, that learning curve is huge and it should not be uh, undervalued. Now yeah. I want to change gears a little bit because we threw in Slack uh, about what you're doing at your company. You mentioned it before. And some people were like, whoa, 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 whoa. That seems like it's just privacy laws out the window. You're staring at my WhatsApp chats. You're going to think that I am totally mental. Uh, can you <laughs> explain how you yeah. get around privacy and what is what data are you using? What are you looking at? And mm -hmm. how does this look? Yeah, definitely. And this is a really great and important question. Um, you know, I think like, it's clear, especially like post pandemic, that uh, mental health is a very serious problem. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that by 2030, it'll be the leading cause of disease worldwide. 
And so, uh, you know, we don't really have the tools to uh, address this issue. And so uh, I think there's definitely like a lot of work that needs to be done in this space, but privacy is obviously very important. People, uh, you know, there's lots of different perspectives and concerns here. I, I would say that the way that I approach and like think about this is one, there is a trade-off of sharing data in that, you know, uh, if you don't share any data, you often are going to lose out on some benefits, you know? Um, and, you know, so just like as an example, like if you are like on an e-commerce website or something, you know, and you don't share any data, they're not going to show you as relevant ads probably. Um, and I think like, you know, sometimes those ads get too relevant for people and they're just like, whoa, you know, this is creepy, you know, <laughs> like I, I was just talking about this thing. Um, but so I think that the, the first thing is you, you need, I, I think a lot of people are pretty okay with their data being shared. If you can communicate to, it, to them why you need that data, what is it being used for? And I think like what, what some people get fearful of is like, yo, you're hoarding my data and I don't see why you're using it. How is this benefiting me? You know? And so I think like everything needs to come back to be like person centered, you know, how is this helping that specific person? Um, and I think if you can communicate that well, people are much more comfortable with it. Two, there's a level of like trust in that, like, you know, a, a lot of, uh, I could tell you like why I'm using your data, but if I'm keeping your raw data on my servers, if you don't trust the security I have and whatnot, uh, or you don't trust me to not use it for other things, then that becomes problematic. Um, and then the third thing I think uh, is people want control, you know? So it has to be more than just me telling you what I'm gonna do with your data. I have to give you the option to say, you know, I see that you could give me this thing, but I'm still not comfortable. And, you know, uh, fourth thing, when people do that, uh, we, we gotta stay out of a place where it's like, okay, we're not gonna help you if you don't share everything with us. We need to have some kind of graceful degradation. Um, and so that, that, that's sort of like the, the sort of pillars that I think about. Um, and so I think a lot about like one, making sure we're only collecting the data that is useful and we know is useful for a specific purpose. And the way that we know that is through like validated clinical studies. Um, and so we make sure that there has actually been research to show this is actually very useful um, for some signal that we don't have today. Uh, two, making sure that we have the right language and whatnot to communicate to people, this is why that uh, is, is useful to collect. And I think that that's a place that our company today, uh, we, we could use a lot of help on. Uh, we're, uh, I think we're about to close on somebody who's really good at this and is gonna help us a lot with it. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but uh, third thing is making sure we're not retaining data that we don't need. Uh, so something that I've been kind of digging into and looking at is like, you know, we can keep the data for the most part on the device. Sometimes we need to do processing, but you know, there are things we can do where maybe we either process the data on the device and just send sort of like the, the downstream stuff, or maybe we kind of like send the raw data, process it, but have very small retention. So that like, even if we get hacked, you know, they're not getting your raw data in any way. Um, and the fourth thing, you know, we need like very strong controls about like very, very strong and clear controls about like, hey, here's the data that you can opt in and out of. Um, but I think like at the end of the day, there's always going to be people that are still uncomfortable with it. Um, and I, I, I think I, I generally have a personal opinion that, you know, uh, I think it's totally fine, but I think then there's a degree of like the solution we're building can't work for you. Uh, like often the people we're targeting uh, are living with a chronic, like severe mental illness and the treatments that we have don't work effectively enough. And I think that a lot of people in this group think it's a fair trade-off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, but yeah, definitely there's a huge responsibility on our end to make sure that we are kind of like protecting their data. And there, there's also laws that we have to be compliant with uh, like HIPAA. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually are looking at, we, we're only operating in the US right now, but we're looking at being GDPR compliant as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but yeah, new, definitely super important issue. The new stuff that's coming out in the EU, I'm sure is mm -hmm. very interesting and a uh, little bit of hoops that you'll have to jump through if you do come yeah. over to this side of the pond. I still w am wondering a little bit about how, 
how does that work? Like, because I imagine you can't go into WhatsApp and see what people are yeah. doing in WhatsApp and you yeah. can't go into someone's Instagram and see what mm -hmm. they're doing. And like you said, maybe that doesn't even matter because it's not like, well, maybe looking at Instagram, I think that is, has been clinically proven yeah. to be kind of bad. Uh, but the questions that I have, some people's Instagram look drastically, well, basically everyone's Instagram feed looks drastically different than yeah. everyone else's. And so one person's Instagram feed can be very uplifting and inspiring and the others, maybe not so much. How do you measure that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, um, one, I th in a lot of cases we could collect data like that because there are APIs and whatnot, but we don't today. We, we don't have any integrations with like Instagram, WhatsApp. We don't look at your messages, your calls, nothing like that. Um, really like the, the way we kind of think about what we do, uh, when you look at mental health conditions, uh, like when we talk about depression uh, or anxiety, like what these conditions are, are really a cluster of symptoms. Um, and so we look at the, the symptoms that are associated with depression and we start thinking, how could we use passive data from the phone to like, understand whether you're experiencing that symptom? Um, so for instance, like one very common symptom that, uh, exists across a wide variety of, uh, mental disorders is sleep disturbances. Most people are using their phone right till they go to sleep and they use it as soon as they wake up. And so we can get a sense of how well you're sleeping, you know, just from looking at, was your phone on or off for the most part? Um, we can get a sense your, your phone is kind of like tracking your activity, uh, to some degree. So we know when you're driving or when you're walking or when you're running. And so we can get a sense of like, you know, how active are you being, you know, um, something that we're looking into today, um, you know, your Bluetooth device uh, list at any given time gives you a sense of like, are you being around people and being social? Um, and so we can get like signals into like, are you being isolated or uh, do you have like a support network of people? Um, and so that, so generally we think about that, but I think your point uh, about, you know, Instagram feeds, for instance, can look so different is, is a very important one. Uh, Cause one of the challenges in this space is you have such heterogeneous data and the, you have high heterogeneity of the data. Uh, all these signals are super noisy and the labels that we're working with are very sparse. People like the, the state of the art basically for measurement in the mental health space uh, is generally patient reported outcomes. So a doctor is going to give you, uh, for instance, if you say, hey, doc, I'm feeling sad, they're going to give you this questionnaire called a PHQ. And it's like nine questions that assess if you're depressed or not. And, you know, you might fill it up today but you're probably not going to take another one tomorrow or the next day and whatnot. And so we lose a lot of visibility. Um, and so most of the time we don't have labels um, and, you know, solving that sort of problem is, is uh, typically challenging. Um, so I, I try to stay away from data sources that are a little too heterogeneous. So, you know, I feel like where the signal seems a little too hard to extract. So like right now, like thinking about Instagram, there's, there's lots of studies on like social media use and like, things you can extract out of that that are useful, but the sort of like, there's a lot of people who don't use Instagram, you know, and I, we, we have to think about like how scalable is this solution really? You know, like there, there's a lot of interesting solutions in like uh, more physical biomarker space, like think like brain scans and whatnot, but it's like, oh, well, we can't really get a brain scan from a person like, you know, very frequently. Um, and so it's like, that's not a very scalable solution um, because like really our goal is to like make, a scalable solution to uh, expand like access to care. One of the things I think that you really talk about well is trade-offs and how those play into product, you know, I guess you would say business or impact and into the technical decision-making and engineering, right? That's, at, that's kind of at the heart of everything that I kind of feel like you write and talk about, which is what are the trade-offs you're trying to make? right? Um, with every decision. And one question I have is, can you tell us about some of the most difficult trade-offs you've had to make in some of the engineering projects you've run, whether it's at Health Rhythms or at LinkedIn? What do you feel are maybe some of the stories that you come back to or the consistent sort of trade-offs that you have to make as you kind of build scale data and machine learning projects? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think like, um, because like most of my 
uh, career so far was spent at LinkedIn. Like uh, my mind instantly jumps to things that happened at LinkedIn. Um, right. And this is uh, definitely connections to stuff we chatted about with Alex. But, uh, you know, I think like, you know, while I was at LinkedIn, one of the things that I noticed is, uh, you know, we had search and recommendation for enterprise customers. So think recruiters trying to find people to hire. And then we had search and recommendation for people on the uh, job seeker side. So think of like, if you go to LinkedIn and search for a job or get recommendations for a job, and these were four separate teams, you know, you can imagine enterprise search, enterprise recommendation, job seeker search, job seeker recommendation. And there, there's a lot of commonalities between these problems. Like at the end of the day, like LinkedIn wants to see people get hired, but all of all four of these teams were doing drastically different things, reinventing the wheel. And so like, I, I think like this is like one trade-off that I like recognized fairly early that like there's a trade-off here between, uh, you know, pe people are not like leveraging things from each other. Everybody's like building their own bespoke solutions. And there's awesome things like, you know, when we thought of like the job seeker side, those folks had developed a really good understanding of what it means for somebody to be interested in a job as an applicant. And the people on the enterprise side developed a very good understanding of what it means to be qualified for a job. And those two, those two worlds were not meeting, you know, and uh, it, it's hard to make those two worlds meet because, you know, when we think about like making solutions that are leverageable, you increase like communication overhead. And so a lot of people get upset because they're just like, you know, you're wrecking my velocity. You know, I'm trying to move fast and you're kind of getting in the way because you're trying to make me uh, do this. And so I think one of the, that, that was one of the uh, earliest memories of grappling with like a, a really important trade-off um, because like we could clearly recognize, you know, and this is still a problem on LinkedIn. People talk about the application black hole problem because like, you know, for so long, LinkedIn optimized for job applies that they would send unqualified applicants and you end up with thousands of unqualified applicants. And then you have qualified applicants come in and they're just like lost in the noise. And, you know, on, on the flip side, you know, recruiters would be reaching out to people who like, are like, Hey, this is spam. I don't care about this opportunity. You know, stop bugging me. And, you know, it took us a long time. I, I think there's still a long way to go. Um, but uh, we made like a lot of progress on like saying like, Hey guys, we need to kind of like centralize more uh, of this stuff so that we're kind of like leveraging the same pieces, like across the board. Um, and I think like, you know, a lot of people felt that they lost some agency in that. Um, but I think like overall, it was sort of like the right thing to do. Um, and over time, uh, you know, like as Alex was sharing, uh, you know, uh, it, it worked out very well and they're able to start iterating like much more quickly and build off of the work each other was doing. That's a great story. I think that really, it helps illustrate, you know, I think some of the, some of the points that you were making earlier about how um, process, objective, uh, these are the things that matter more at a given time than, you know, what tool you might be using, what stack, mm -hmm. uh, the things that on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you can kind of get caught up in. And I think, you know, coming up on coming up on time here, but one last question that I have, maybe Demetrius has something else to say, uh, is kind of around just coming back to that data, uh, data piece and, and sort of data engineering piece, you know, I know we said don't think too much about tools, but what are some of the tools that you think are showing some of the improvements in workflow or some of the step function changes in how we think about data that you have enjoyed playing around with? I think for me, I learned a lot, you know, I don't necessarily love it, but I've learned a lot from working with Airflow. And looking at prefect, right? Those are two, 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 two tools in the data orchestration world that made me think a lot more about you know how we do machine learning. Are there any other such tools for you? Yeah, um, I think in general, I, I had a bad experience with Airflow, but I think that was uh, largely because we had a pretty janky setup. Um, and uh, you know, I, one of my friends uh, is like a PMC on Airflow, so uh, I think he's uh, improving things a lot there. Um, I, I generally find that like these like DAG systems, I often like it, Laszlo's uh, again, uh, you know, Laszlo just has like so many good, good bits in, in the Slack. Um, <laughs> I, I just like keep coming back to things he said, you know, but uh, one of the things he talks about uh, a lot that I agree with is like a lot of times people start using these DAG systems for like ML and it's like, 
you know, usually you don't really have a DAG. You kind of have a line. You, know? you just have like a sequence. Um, that there's not a whole lot of like parallelization you need there. Um, and so like sometimes the DAG solutions feel a bit overkill. Um, and I, I tend to agree with that. Um, but some of the tools that I've kind of enjoyed working with, um, I, I've actually, I really enjoyed Databricks. Um, I really like felt like there, there's a lot of gaps that I found with it that were a little annoying, but at the same time, it felt like the right level of abstraction for me. Uh, and I like how it kind of brought everything together. Um, you know, uh, I felt it was very easy for me to write streaming systems. It was very easy for me to kind of like integrate with like all sorts of different tools. Uh, it was very easy for me to kind of like programmatically kind of like search through our data catalog. Uh, and so I, I felt like it, it actually gave like a pretty good step function increase, um, especially because everything was brought together. It, it wasn't like all these disparate tools kind of connected together. Um, but uh, I'm also interested in uh, a lot of tools that are like more in this data centric AI space. Uh, so I've been watching companies like Snorkel and uh, Watchful. Um, in this space to just see, because uh, I think that those companies are kind of getting more at like this sort of like iterative, how do you iterate on your data, you know? Um, and I think that is maybe like the machine learning analog of Excel, maybe. Um, and so like, I'm very interested in some of those companies. Uh, Snowflake is obviously like another company that's uh, doing great things in this space and is a, a great platform. Uh, though I think for machine learning, like the, the it's kind of like a Databricks versus Snowflake thing uh, in, in the industry and i think in general like databricks seems like machine learning first analytics second and snowflake is like the other way around yeah. um and so i think like depending on like what you are going to focus on as a company and what you think is more important that might give you like a sense of like what you should lean towards um but yeah so th those are some of the tools that i'm liking but to, also there's like much smaller tools that i think are like interesting um, so like I mentioned before, I really love Jacopo's sort of like uh, you don't need a bigger boat uh, setup. Um, I think there's a lot of good tools there like DBT and whatnot. And I, I, I particularly I, I found recently that I'm particularly biased against solutions that have me managing like any server that's continuously running. So like I generally like am kind of like biasing towards like serverless solutions. And I'm noticing a lot of the uh, stuff that Jacopo had in his recommendations were just a bunch of serverless solutions. and. I, I really appreciated that because um, it, it, it felt simple to me. Awesome. So last words that I would love to hear from you because we originally planned on talking about the theme uh, around how the future of data science platforms is accessibility and iterability. Mm -hmm. Can you throw some last words onto that. I mean, it feels like we talked about it in a roundabout way, but I'd love to hear yeah. what you have to say to close it up. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, and I think a lot of this is coming from my experience in working in a healthcare space. If you take a data scientist, they do not have the clinical background. And I think there's a lot of really important problems that data science and machine learning can be really helpful towards, but a data scientist does not have all the information that they need. And you, you see this even in companies where like data scientists often don't have the ML ops knowledge, you know, and there, there's a little bit of a, it takes a village kind of mentality. And I think like right now, when I'm like looking at collaboration between these various groups, a lot of times all of them are accessing data and looking at data, but everybody's using bespoke tools. Um, so at LinkedIn, for instance, a common problem I saw was you have data scientists and machine learning engineers uh, each using different systems and implementing metrics. And so, you know, now we have two definitions of metrics and, you know, they're not consistent, not the same. And that, that could cause a lot of problems in, in collaboration. And so, you know, I very much think like the more that we can kind of like promote accessibility so that like people can jump in and like look at what you're doing, even if they're not an engineer, um, you know, like obviously I don't expect like, you know, if I like share an output with somebody, I don't expect them to uh, kind of jump in and edit and modify it and whatnot and write code because they, they might be like less technical, but it, at least having a way for me to share what I'm doing with other people uh, in a way that's not like just a presentation, you know, just to, like, especially as we're going more like remote and things are having to be more async, like how can I like make what I'm doing uh, more accessible and shareable 
uh, to folks outside of my role, I think is super important. Um, and then I think like in general, especially in data science problems, you know, I think like one of the problems that I often have with this like black and white production quality mindset that I, I sense some people have is that I think the reality is we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, like part of the process is really finding out what we're doing. Um, and I think we're working on hard problems and there's lots of constraints. There's lots of information that we don't have. And, you know, everybody that's an expert in particular thing X uh, tends to shout like, ah, you didn't do this thing and that's why you failed, blah, blah, blah. And I think like the reality is like, this is just very complex. There's a lot of different uh basically insights and expertise that you need to really make something useful. And it's unlikely that a single person is going to have all of that. And so what can we do to basically build tools to aid in that discovery process uh, in an accessible way? So everybody can come together and iterate on their understanding and their solution together. Um, and I think like that, that's the thing that like I'm very interested in. And like you mentioned, I'm not working on a product in this space, but you know, if somebody builds a product in this space, I would buy it. <laughs> Man, you're going to get reached out by every single salesperson in the community I right know. now. <laughs> but I want to thank you, Skylar Payne. If anyone out there is listening and you want to go work on cool stuff in the healthcare space, as we said earlier, Skylar's team is hiring. And they just raised their seed round, which was a ginormous seed round. 11 million is yeah, not at all small for a seed. Uh, I want to thank you. This is awesome. And I look forward to when you come back on and co-host with me because your insights are always invaluable, are so valuable. I cannot thank you enough. This has been awesome, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was fun. See y'all later. That was another incredible MLOps community coffee sa coffee hour session, whatever you want to call it. I don't even know the names of our own podcast anymore. And as always, if you are still tuning in, we would really appreciate a like, a subscribe, a comment, whatever. Drop a line wherever you listen to podcasts or if you're watching us on YouTube. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the MLOps community.